Hello and welcome back everyone to uh, another one of our YouTube channel interviews with people doing interesting things in the physical therapy and physical medicine space. I'm range master Rob Allen uh, and we're the shoulder pulley company, uh, but we're in the middle of breast cancer awareness month. And so our special guest today is Taryn Thomas, a physical therapist now working in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. But uh, Taryn is an oncology specialist. And Taryn, why don't you say it how you would normally <laughs> say your title so I don't botch it? Sure. So it's a board certified clinical specialist in oncologic physical therapy. It's kind of the mouthful of the words. It essentially just means I'm a physical therapist with extra training specifically in oncology. And so that's kind of my expertise and specialty, just like several other fields of physical therapy have specialties. Okay, well, the, the fun part of these interviews is always uh, answering the question, how did you get here? And <laughs> uh, so where are you working right now? What's, uh, what, what, what is your duty station, if you will? Sure, so I am in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is actually my hometown. And I'm kind of in the works of starting an outpatient oncology program. So that's kind of in the very beginning stages with um, an outpatient, local outpatient clinic. So that's kind of the, the works and kind of the exciting things happening. Um, a little bit of a back history, kind of how I got here. I was previously at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas for the last five years and moved back home with my husband this past year in 2020. So just kind of my experience in the oncology world of PT really started at MD Anderson and kind of just grew into a passion. And that's where I have my experience and some great mentorship. And that being such a big city and place with amazing medical resources coming back home, I kind of realized there was just a lack of service in the oncology world, especially from a physical therapy standpoint. So it just kind of has spurred me on to create something that the community doesn't really have. Great. Um, well, let's, uh, let's, let's back up then. Uh, you grew up in Coeur d'Alene? Yes. And went to high school there? Yep. Yep. Coeur d'Alene High School. And when did you know uh, that you were going to become a physical therapist? Tell mm -hmm. us about that little journey. Sure. So in High school, I was kind of always really interested in large animals, actually. Grew up on a farm, did 4-H, and that was kind of a passion. Also played sports, and so just the sports and the animals were kind of a passion. Um, I learned about hippotherapy, which is using horses to help people with physical therapy, and so that was kind of like the best of both worlds. I get to work with horses and help people in a physical therapy standpoint. So that was kind of my ambition and passion. I went to Carroll College in Helena, Montana, and studied just like health sciences, pre-physical therapy, and some anthrozoology. And from there, I went to grad school at University of New England in Portland, Maine for three years, graduated in 2015, and ended up doing my last clinical rotation in Houston um, on the pediatric cancer floor and just really fell in love with it. So kind of went from a hippotherapy focus of what initially intrigued me with physical therapy to um, just learning more in school that the whole population of people with cancer can really benefit to you. And so that kind of just sparked a passion and fell in love with it when I was in Houston. And so now that's kind of where we're at. Great. That's a, that's interesting. So you went from semi-rural North Idaho to pretty rural um, Montana and then all the way up to Maine, were you a college athlete by, by any chance? I was, I played soccer at Carroll College. Yeah, um, you, certainly a lot of high school and college athletes uh, in the physical therapy uh, business these days. Um, and then I, uh, tell us a little bit about your, uni your university experience in Maine. Uh, I hadn't heard of that university, uh, but of course, uh, I went to Eastern Washington University. A lot of people haven't heard of that. So tell sure. us a little about going to, going to Maine. How did you choose it or did they choose you? What happened? 
Sure. A little bit of both. My dad's actually from Maine, which really was the first reason I was kind of intrigued in going to the East Coast. And I've always loved home, but kind of wanted to get out and explore a little bit. And so I applied to a couple schools on the East Coast in addition to the West Coast. And when I went out for my interview, just really fell in love with it. And it's it's just very different than home. And so kind of just packed up my dog and drove across the country and explored, <laughs> explored Maine, which is, which is really great. I'm really happy that I have that experience and just the difference that it brings from here. And so it does make you appreciate home and where you come from, but I'm really thankful to have that experience and just some great mentorship and one specific professor who just kind of really sparked that interest in oncology. So I think it's all worked out how it's supposed to. People always seem surprised to learn that Portland, Oregon is farther north than Portland, Maine. I think mm -hmm. somehow in our minds, we have it tucked way up there. And yet, uh, you know, uh, because of the way the globe is shaped, we're, we're all kind of in that northern tier. Right. Um, and did you go directly to MD Anderson out of college? Out of grad school, I did. I kind of created a clinical rotation site with the University of New England and MD Anderson. Just during physical therapy school, you have different clinical rotations. And I was specifically interested in a pediatric oncology one and it didn't really exist or our school didn't have connections with that. And so I just kind of helped facilitate that relationship and spent my last three months of grad school in a clinical at MD Anderson. And when I was there, just fell in love. So later that fall after graduation, started working there. Gosh, uh, that's really going right to the top if, uh, if their <laughs> reputation is uh, everything I hear about. Yes, it's a great place. Well, um, was there any cancer in any of your extended family that caused any of this kind of interest or was it purely the work itself? There wasn't any particular um, close family member who had an experience. I think it was, it really was the work itself. And that passion for wanting to work with kids and the hippotherapy kind of world works with um, a lot of adults and kids with physical and uh, mental disabilities. And so having that as kind of a population who can be somewhat underserved, I feel like the oncology population was very similar. And um, it was just kind of one of those things where I started in it and really fell in love and so that passion has just continued to grow. Now the APTA has a special oncology section. Are you a member of that, yes. that group? Yes. And so let's, uh, my mental calculations tell me you're out of school, what, five or six years now? Yes, yep. And is there uh, a need for mentorship for young physical therapists to consider this as a specialty area? Yeah, absolutely. I really believe so. I think in every physical therapy school is a little bit different, but I didn't really even know physical therapy, what like oncology was a specialty. And it was really actually just in 2019 where the American Physical Therapy Association kind of recognized and created a subspecialty of oncology within the physical therapy world, if you will, where things like orthopedics and neuro and pediatrics, those kind of subspecialties have been in existence for a while, but I think just the education and the research and just the amount of cancer survivors that we have is just exponentially grown, which is a great thing that there was just a need that really needed to be filled. And so the APTA has kind of like stepped in and created that specialty. And it's just another great tool in order to help educate um, current students, people interested in physical therapy, and especially patients and other healthcare providers as far as what we can do. But yeah, yeah I think. Hopefully uh, some will see our interview and uh, perhaps try to reach out to you. So you might be thinking toward the end of, the, of our interview today, if there is an easy way for people to connect with you. Um, but I, I became aware of this, um, a person who worked uh, in cancer care here in Spokane, Washington, where we're located, uh, came to me uh, and said, you know, um, the situation post mastectomy has become somewhat challenging for uh, the patient who doesn't anticipate 
that they're going to have range of motion problems and pain uh, related to the physical uh, downstream effects of the surgery. Um, that had to be five or six years ago. Is that still a, a, a case where you're, you're seeing patients kind of come back in for physical therapy kind of on their own or are most of your um, experience, been, has most of your experience been with patients who get a direct referral coming out of surgery? Um, sure. what, what do you think? So here in like Northern Idaho, just being specifically on the outpatient realm is very different than in the Houston realm where I worked at a large cancer hospital and I actually worked just for the orthopedic surgeons there as part of their team. And so I knew the patients before they even knew who I was, you know, it's so, and it was more of just a direct referral system or meet them in clinic and like a pre-op appointments. And it was just kind of a very streamlined process within that specific department and just being at a big cancer hospital in an inpatient environment, you have those resources and connections with the providers to generate those referrals immediately. And I think that there's a little bit more understanding and buying is the importance of physical therapy when you have a big all-encompassing center like that. I think some of the struggles, whether it's more rural or just on an outpatient is just the education from uh, like a community standpoint, healthcare provider standpoint, and that really that need for physical therapy. So right now, a lot of referrals do are a lot of word of mouth, or um, I think that education and knowledge is being spread to the physicians and the research is more and more coming out about the importance of exercise, especially with all of the survivors that the importance of physical therapy is, is proven and is there. And it's, we're still just like a little bit slower, I think up here and probably several other places, you know, when you go from kind of the best to, to coming up to where there's just less resources, then it's a little bit harder um, to get that word out, which is kind of what I'm excited about, but there's just so much opportunity to be able to share like the knowledge and the benefits and hopefully make that a more well known thing that if you get a diagnosis of breast cancer or any cancer, like you really should be also getting an immediate physical therapy referral. At MD Anderson, you said you, you knew who they were before they knew you. So okay. basically they were telling the whole team, we've got a new patient coming in and here's what their cancer is and here's what we're gonna do. And so here's, here's what we need to be thinking about afterward is that, did you have any preoperative visits with patients? I did, yeah, in the role that I was in. It was, it was a very unique role where there was just another therapist and I who worked directly with those orthopedic surgeons in their department. And so we were part of those like physician, you know, morning meetings where they would go over the caseload and um, we would be able to go to pre-op appointments and meet patients in pre-op and explain after the physician, you know, explains what surgery they're getting. Then we can come in and be like, here are some specific things from a immediately post-op or a functional standpoint that with your surgery are things to consider. And so it was, it was a very nice, I think all encompassing model. And then patients aren't really surprised after the fact, if they do have impairments or they it's, we're at least a familiar face already. And right. so kind of building that rapport, I think, I think in the earlier stages is really important just so the patients feel like they have another person on their side who can help them. Those patients are coming out oftentimes with the drainage ports. Um, and I, I, I would suspect with your training in wound care that it might be potentially a place for the handoff to occur. Did you find yourself assisting in that area or did you not get to the patient until after the ports were removed? Sure. So again, in Houston, it was, it was pretty specific, the role that I was in, but we would see people in the intensive care unit immediately after surgery or once they were cleared by the team. And so we worked with people often with drains. Um, that was more of an orthopedic oncology field where like, for example, for breast cancer, a lot of times people post mastectomy will come out with drains also there's a little bit different guidelines as far as when it's appropriate to start therapy, often like with patients 
in those cases, physicians like to wait a couple of weeks before you start any like shoulder range of motion or things before, uh, or they would like the drains to be out before you start therapy. And so it kind of just, or specific therapy to the area. So every area of PT is a little bit different. Um, especially with like breast cancer, for example, like lymphedema can be a big issue. And so that is something that um, patients don't often know about, or that can be one of those, unfortunately, one of those um, unfortunate surprises that patients get after a diagnosis of breast cancer, after treatment for breast cancer. Um, and so like, that's an example of where physical therapy can be really beneficial. So they are having, uh, those infected uh, lymph nodes removed and now they're not getting the drainage that uh, the body normally performs. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this breast cancer patient. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, initial assessment and what are you looking for? Um, and uh, you've kind of touched on lymphedema, but uh, uh, kind of give us a look in your mind about uh, your assessment and uh, treatment plan. Sure, sure. So if if we're first time meeting the patient in the outpatient world, um, then of course just having an understanding of like what treatments, what type of breast cancer they had, because that will determine the treatments. And for example, there's several different chemotherapies that are used to treat breast cancer, and those chemotherapies each have their own toxicity. And so knowing what treatments they are on, if they received chemotherapy, um, is important. If they received radiation you know, kind of their past level of function, of course, their goals, if an overall just physical assessment, like we would do with normal physical therapy, you know, range of motion, their gait, their balance, their safety, if they're having pain, um, like what issues that they have, you know, as far as function, or if they're just, if they're dealing with a lot of cancer related fatigue. And so it's very specific, of course, to the person, but an, an initial assessment with um, someone with breast cancer would be um, depending on their treatment, if they had mastectomy or any lymph nodes removed. A lot of education is really what go, happens in the first. It's kind of just me getting a great assessment of where they're at, what treatment they've had, what they have left in their plan of care for treatment, um, symptoms that they're currently undergoing, education on what treatments they're getting. Often that is not done from like a physician level, as far as you're going to have these taxane drugs, for example, and these taxanes are going to cause, you know, nerve damage. And that can look like, you know, not feeling your feet or loss of loss of balance, or, you know, just things that are, mm -hmm. it's easy to kind of take, they might understand what drugs they're getting, but they might not know like the practical implications of some of those side effects and what that looks like in their daily life. So kind of helping them pick apart well, these are my struggles. And you're like, well, these struggles can be related to this treatment or to this. And this is how we can kind of together go about addressing these. And so really just figuring out where people are, what their goals are, how we can improve their quality of life. And everyone's treatment looks a little bit different, but that's where we would start. <laughs> Taryn, what can you tell us about the current uh, frequency or numbers of people that are involved with uh, the different cancers that we're talking about today. Sure. Sure. So the, like the average amount of diagnosis per year goes up a little bit. Um, but good news, the survival rate also goes up with that. There's actually a 90% five-year survival rate for people diagnosed with breast cancer these days, which is great. Um, and that just means that we have more survivors needing physical therapy and Survivorship, I really like to tell patients, survivorship starts at like the day of diagnosis. It doesn't mean that you um, have to live past that five-year mark to be called a survivor. I think that that survivorship really starts in the beginning. Um, and out of those 90%, um, about, well, about one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And unfortunately, only like 75% of those who uh, will choose to receive treatment. And of course, that's a very, that's a very personal choice. Um, out of that 75% of women who do decide to receive treatment, about 10 to 40% of those will develop 
um, lymphedema in their first year. And I think lymphedema, you know, patients might just think it's like a, like a swelling comes with a the territory. They might hear a little bit from friends or, you know, their medical team that you might get this, but they don't really know that it, what it is and how physical therapy can help. Um, and there's actually like a 50 to 75% of those women who seek treatment five years post post-op or post breast cancer treatment will develop lymphedema. And that can be a really um, like life altering and quality of life hindering um, diagnosis. And it's not something that goes away. It's not treatable. It's really like a mechanical insufficiency of your lymphatic system. Um, and that is like an area where physical therapy can be just a huge, a huge benefit from an education standpoint and giving patients the tools um, and ideally seeking treatment right away once those symptoms start. Um, men also get breast cancer. It's a very small percent. It's like less than 1% of those diagnosed with cancer. Um, it's just a little over 2,000, 2,600 people in 2021 will be men diagnosed with breast cancer. And it's over 281,000 women who will be diagnosed with breast cancer estimated in 2021. So the numbers are quite different, um, but of course it is still something that happens in men too. Well, that, those, are, those are really interesting statistics. Tell me, what, what is the typical physical therapy, number one thing you tell a lymphedema patient to do? With, is, is there anything in specific that they need to be doing? It really depends on their stage of lymphedema, you know, and so just like consistency is really key. So protecting that upper extremity and what that looks like depends on the phase of treatment that they're in, in the type, in the stage of lymphedema that they have really. Um, I would say the most important thing would be able to seek a physical therapist who has lymphedema training in order to get the education that they need for their specific stage of lymphedema and depending on where they're at in their treatment or how many years post-treatment they are and kind of what they can do. Cause it is a progressive disease and it will continue to get worse, but it is something that can be um, significantly slowed or at least maintained. And if caught early, like significantly reduced. So you don't have those limitations from it. Right. Well, they can't go to uh physical therapy every day, do you give them some home uh, exercise program to do? Yes, yep. So just like most physical therapy places, um, exercises of course at home and just continuing that consistency, it's really like a lifestyle change for, for lack of a better word. Um, in acute lymphedema, Ideally, we are seeing the patients like three to five times a week. Five times a week in the outpatient setting is, is not very feasible, but that is kind of the gold standard and seeing patients every day for a couple of weeks while, so we can really manage that acute lymphedema. And then it will decrease frequency, um, of course, until people are kind of on their own. And that's a lot of times where they'll be in compression garments, ideally, depending on their lymphedema. And so and have checkups with physical therapy and be participating in routine skincare and exercises at home and things. It's kind of, again, like an all encompassing process where there's a lot of little factors to it, but um, I think just that education from the beginning and especially like around time of diagnosis of how physical therapy can help. And really ideally if everyone diagnosed with cancer could get in to see a physical therapist specifically one who has oncology training um, soon after their diagnosis would be ideal because there's a lot of things that therapists can do to help walk patients through, um, through that treatment. And so they're not just stuck dealing with the side effects years after treatment, but you can kind of combat them and work through them during the treatment. So they're feeling their best and addressing all of those needs before they get. Did you use any tele, telehealth uh, during the pandemic uh, to stay in contact with patients? You know, I did not, no, no. Been a lot of conversation about telehealth and, uh, and the way to cut down on the amount of travel time and things like that. Uh, 
but uh, everybody everybody needs some encouragement one way or the other. Right, absolutely. In general, um, do you find patients um, surprised to learn that physical therapy is going to be uh, a part of their recovery, uh, or do you think they're getting? Uh, and let's just talk about where you are now. Are they are they getting enough heads up uh, going through the process? I think there's um, having. I, I have just gone through a, a a prostate cancer experience, and I realized that some of the things that may have been told to me about the level of fatigue I might have after radiation therapy or the side effects of scarring or inflammation. Uh, I'll bet they told me, but I bet I didn't hear it because I was thinking, am I going to live or how long am I going to live, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is that the case that you're seeing with your um, uh, oncology patients uh, that that's the first hurdle? Let's, let's save the life and then, and then let's deal with everything else downstream. Sure. Well, first, I'm sorry that you had to go undergo that experience with prostate cancer. Um, that is very common. One of the most types of most common types of cancer in the U.S. Yes. I mean, honestly, I'm a little early in my experience up here. Um, just recently having gotten kind of back into the PT world and starting that up here. And so I think it's a little bit too early to tell, but I think from a general approach it there does just needs to be more education on like the community level and the physician level and the whole healthcare provider team as far as like looking at physical therapy as like a really important piece of the puzzle I think that patients often probably like your experience you know you have a, a meeting with a physician and you get the diagnosis of cancer and everything kind of just goes in yeah. one year and out the other because you're just really focused on the necessities and surviving, you know, what, what's next. And so I'm not sure where the ideal spot for introducing physical therapy is within the healthcare model, if you will. I think it is very, very important that it is introduced very early on, such as other like approaches like nutrition and just that whole body encompassing mm -hmm. care and um, approaching things from like that holistic standpoint. But a uh, on the first visit, I don't know if that's like the most appropriate time. That's obviously up to the physicians and what each patient needs. But I think that there is just in general inconsistencies in physical therapy being known as an option, you know, and I think we all have a role in that, like physical therapists in general and just getting the word out because since it is a little bit newer of a specialty, a lot of people in the community and patients don't even know that their physical therapy can help or how they can help, or mm -hmm. they just thought you go to physical therapy if you had a sports injury or a knee replacement, you know? And so digging into a little bit more of the specifics of like how physical therapists can help with cancer related fatigue and then educating the physicians also on the same and just, you know, being that really that team approach, we're just kind of a piece of the puzzle. It, like that can really also benefit like the physicians as far as outcomes and patient satisfaction and just we all want the best for the patients of course and so that's that's yeah. the goal yeah i i can see i can see um, both sides of this now i mean certainly and it's complicated by access to physicians is not is not readily available after you've got your initial uh, evaluation you're seeing a lot of you know nurse practitioners or medical assistants or I think they in, in cancer care, there's a nurse navigator sometimes that's assigned to help. All those people uh, would benefit from a healthy dose of uh, physical therapy education to know, uh, you know, that there's going to be downstream uh, aftershocks, if you will, and uh, and we all need to be re uh, ready to to talk that language. Well, let's let's move on uh, and close up here with some kind of fun thoughts. Um, you're not the first person to move back to North Idaho. In fact, uh, between Coeur d'Alene and Boise, two uh, of the fastest growing areas in the country right now of people 
uh, coming back or, or moving here for the first time. You mentioned uh, your husband, was he also from Coeur d'Alene or did, uh, did, you, did you have to convince him that this was gonna be a great landing spot? He's actually from Houston, outside of Houston. So um, I didn't have to do a lot of convincing, you know, like many people who move to the area, you come up here a few times and you kind of fall in love with it. So he's not from here, but he kind of, he came up here pretty quick. He jumped, he jumped right in. Yeah. And, uh, and now to kind of, we're sort of the uh, outdoor sports area of the, of the world. You know, we have a downhill skiing and bicycling and lots of trails and of course, beautiful lakes. Um, and and uh, you're, uh, you're doing triathletes, uh, triathlons now. Uh, tell, tell us about how you got started there. Was that something you brought with you from Houston or did you just kind of get in the scene here? Sure. So growing up um, in Coeur d'Alene, in 4-H, we used to volunteer for the Ironman here in Coeur d'Alene. And so just being out there and watching these people, it was just really inspiring and encouraging. And just as a little kid, I was like, well, if they can do that, I can do that. And so it kind of just started, that has always been on like my bucket list, if you will, of doing an Ironman. And so one of my good college teammates and um, husband, we decided to train for an Ironman. And unfortunately it was the year they canceled the Coeur d'Alene one back in 2018. And so we ended up doing one in Santa Rosa and it was great. And then, but when we moved back here to Coeur d'Alene, I was kind of like, well, Coeur d'Alene's really always been the one on my list. And so I just did the Coeur d'Alene Ironman back in June, a few months ago. So that was, that was fun. I wouldn't say it's like a a big passion or hobby. I mean, training for one Ironman is pretty much a hobby. It's kind of like a job, really. It takes a lot of time, <laughs> but it's not, triathlons aren't necessarily like a a big part of my life, but they're kind of just like a, a thing that I really enjoy doing. What other things do you do outdoors? Are you still involved with horses? Sure. Not, I, I have an old horse, but <laughs> as far as like being really involved, no, um, that is also kind of on the, on the goal ambition list is to be able to start like a hippotherapy practice in the area to be able to serve people in that way too. Um, I do still love horses and we have some acreage that we're living on right now. And so have some farm animals and stuff, which I love, which is kind of the lifestyle of why we wanted to move back to the area, but really anything outdoors, you know, hiking and snowshoeing and snowboarding in the winter and anything on the water in the summer. And so it's, it's not a hard area to find things to do outdoors. That's for sure. No, no, it isn't. Well, uh, Taryn, we talked about uh, if some therapists want to reach out to you, are you comfortable giving them a way to contact you uh, if they're viewing yeah. this video? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So absolutely. How, would, how would you like them to do that? So probably just my, actually just my old university email right now would probably be the best. Um, and that is T-E-L-A at U-N-E dot E-D-U. Okay. All right. We'll, uh, we'll probably try to put that on uh, as you say it here uh, with graphics, if that's uh, yeah, seems appropriate. Absolutely. And um, well, I really want to thank you for participating. I think this is a good time to remind everyone at least once a year that um, people are going to face challenges after cancer, uh, that uh, the therapy itself, uh, including the radiation, uh, can be pretty disruptive. And uh, fatigue certainly is a part. Scarring is a part. Uh, and mental health uh, is a part uh, of all that. And being active and moving is, is important. I'm sure you'd agree. Yes, very much so. Yes, very much. Well, uh, we'll sign off for now. Uh, I'm Range Master Rob Allen, and and I look for our next uh, episode where we'll be talking about physical therapy for video game and esports players. So, thank you for now. Thank you, Rob. Bye bye.